Our Muslim friends assure us that the Quran is perfect, free from error, magnificent, unparalleled, inimitable. It tells us about science, it tells us about history, it champions women's rights. The Quran is a fount of learning, a pillar of moral reasoning, a paragon of pure monotheism. It's been preserved on a tablet in heaven for all eternity and can still slice a tomato paper thin. That's such a great deal. That's awesome. Imagine our surprise, then, when we open up the Quran and find it riddled with more holes than a donut shop, more errors than a Pittsburgh Pirates baseball season, more fallacies than a Zucker Nike lecture, and more corruption than the Dearborn Police Department. Disappointed! The Quran's many, many errors fall into three main categories. There are factual errors. These include scientific errors, historical errors, mathematical errors, and so on. Then there are moral errors, having sex with prepubescent girls, beating women into submission, violently subjugating non-Muslims, etc. And there are theological errors. God is the greatest of deceivers, God doesn't love unbelievers, things like that. If you ever carefully examine one of these errors and you try to discuss it with your Muslim friends, you'll notice the same three-step process almost every time. Step number one, finding a problem passage. As you're reading the Quran, you spot something that's obviously false or totally immoral. So you read it again still wrong. You examine the context. Still wrong. You try reading it backwards. Wrong, wrong, wrong. And by now you're thinking, Muslims have a problem here. Maybe I should take this to my Muslim friend to see if he can explain it for me. Friends do things together. La, 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 la. Step number two, the miracle of reinterpretation. When you bring the false or immoral passage to your Muslim friend, he reinterprets it for you, magically transforming it from a thoroughly embarrassing, silly or wicked teaching into something that's not quite as offensive to the intellect or to our sense of right and wrong. Yes, Allah said one thing, but what he really meant was something totally different. At this point, you're wondering why Allah didn't say what he actually meant in his perfectly clear book. Well, that don't add up. Step number three. Muhammad blocks the reinterpretation. Just when your Muslim friend thinks he's finally come up with an interpretation of the Quran that won't force him to commit intellectual or moral suicide, you go to the Hadith and the commentaries to see how Muhammad and his companions interpreted the passage. That's when you find out that Muhammad and his companions totally contradict your friend's reinterpretation. You feel bad because your Muslim friend really, really wants to rescue the Quran. Unfortunately for him, his prophet had a hard time keeping his mouth shut. shut up! Let's open up a Quran so we can see this three-step process in action. Step number one, finding a problem passage. Here we simply need to start reading until we find an error, a mistake, a blunder. Oh, here's one. Step one doesn't take very long. In Surah 18, 83 through 86, we read, And they ask you about Dhul Karnain. Dhul Karnain is supposedly Alexander the Great. Say, I shall recite to you something of his story. Verily, we established him in the earth, and we gave him the means of everything. So he followed away, until when he reached the setting place of the sun, he found it setting in a spring of black, muddy, or hot water, and he found near it a people. Hmm. This passage seems to be saying that Alexander the Great traveled so far west, he found the place where the sun sets. Where does the sun set? It sets in a spring of muddy water. And people live there.
Let me read a few more translations of Surah 1886 to give you a feel for what this verse is claiming. Pickthal translation. Till when he reached the setting place of the sun, he found it setting in a muddy spring and found a people thereabout. <laughs> Yusuf Ali. Until when he reached the setting of the sun, he found it set in a spring of murky water. Near it, he found a people. <laughs> Shakir. Until when he reached the place where the sun set, he found it going down into a black sea and found by it a people. <laughs> Arberry. Until when he reached the setting of the sun, he found it setting in a muddy spring, and he found nearby a people. <laughs> all of these translators agree on what the Quran is telling us. They all say that Dhul Karnain reached a place. What place? The place where the sun sets. Is there a place where the sun sets? No. Could Alexander the Great have reached it? No. But the Quran says he did. And what did Alexander find when he reached this non-existent place? He found the sun, which is roughly 1.3 million times bigger than our planet, going down into a pool of muddy or murky water. Does the sun set in a pool of murky water? No. Do people live there? No. So we have multiple errors in this verse. I, I try, really, I do, but but everything ends up so hilarious, I can't, <laughs> can't help. <laughs> Step number two, the miracle of reinterpretation. The Quran claims to be perfectly clear. Oddly enough, Muslims constantly find it necessary to clarify this perfectly clear book for us. Let's see if Muslim apologist Zakir Naik can help us understand what Allah really means in Surah 1886. What's Allah really trying to say when he tells us that Dhul Karnain reached the place where the sun sets? When we say sunset, sunset can be taken for time. If I say the sun sets at 7 p.m., I'm using it for time. If I say the sun sets in the west, it means I'm taking it for place. So here, if you use the word Maghrib, for time. So Zulkar Nain not reached that place of sunset, use it at time. He reached at the time of sunset. The problem is solved. Oh, so when Allah tells us that Alexander reached the place where the sun sets, he actually means that Alexander reached some unspecified place as the sun was setting. Now it makes sense. Apparently, Allah just couldn't get the words right the first time around. That's why he sent Zakir Naik to make a few corrections. Thank you, Dr. Naik. Well, I'll be a son of a gun. Now that we've got that cleared up, it shouldn't be much of a problem for Dr. Naik to explain what Allah really means when he says that Alexander found the sun going down into a pool of murky water. The other big word used here is, it is wajada, meaning it appeared to Zulkarnain. And Dr. William Campbell knows Arabic. So wajada means, if you look up in the dictionary also, it means it appeared. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing what appeared to Zulkarnain. Ah. Allah says that Alexander found the sun going down into a pool of murky water, but he really means that Alexander saw some kind of optical illusion. The sun wasn't really setting in a pool of murky water, Alexander just thought it was. Maybe he saw a reflection in the water, and he'd never seen a sunset before, so he got a little confused. Easy mistake. Thank you very much for this information. I'm kind of pressed, sir, so I'm going to run along. Bravo, Dr. Nack. Bravo. I'm sorry, sir. Just one more thing. Step number three. Muhammad blocks the reinterpretation. Sunan Abu Daud, 3991. 
Abu Dar said, I was sitting behind the Apostle of Allah, who was riding a donkey while the sun was setting. He asked, Do you know where this sets? I replied, Allah and his Apostle know best. He said, It sets in a spring of warm water. It sets in a spring of warm water. Where does the sun set? According to Muhammad, it sets in a pool of water. So is there a place where the sun sets? Sure there is. Could we reach this place if we traveled far enough? No reason we couldn't. Make them laugh, make them laugh, make them laugh! Now, how are Muslims going to reinterpret this one? The hadith we read has nothing to do with Alexander the Great, so they can't say, Oh, Muhammad just meant that Alexander saw a mirage. Nor can they say, well, it means that Alexander reached a certain place at sunset. In this Sahih narration from one of Islam's most trusted collections of a hadith, Muhammad, not Alexander the Great, not Zakarnaik, Muhammad tells one of his companions about the sun. He's imparting some of his prophetic knowledge. He asks Abu Dar, do you know where the sun sets? Abu Dar says, you know, you're the prophet here. And Muhammad tells him it sets in a pool of water. There's absolutely no wiggle room for reinterpretation here. I got nowhere else to go! So the perfectly clear Quran tells us that the sun sets in a pool of water. Zakir Knight comes to the rescue and says, no, the Quran can't possibly mean that. But he's immediately corrected by his prophet, who says, stop it, Zakir, that's exactly what it means. Turns out, then, that Zakir Naik hasn't defended Islam at all. Instead, he's insulted both Allah and Muhammad. He insulted Allah by telling us that he can speak more clearly than his God, and he insulted Muhammad by claiming to be a better interpreter of the Quran than his prophet. How dare you! If you really believe that the Quran is the word of Allah, and you really believe that Muhammad is a prophet, your response to people like Zakir Naik should be, How dare you! How dare you try to correct Allah or his prophet! Allah tells us that Dhul Karnain reached the place where the sun sets, so he did. Allah tells us that Dhul Karnain found the sun going down into a pool of water, so that's what he found. Muhammad tells his companion that the sun sets in a pool, so it does. We Muslims trust in Allah, not in the science of the Kufar. I don't know why you always have to be judging me, because I only believe in science. Now, to all my Muslim friends out there, look at the position your religion has put you in. You only have three options here. First, if you're a good Muslim and you agree with Muhammad and the Quran, you have to reject everything we know about science and reality, and you have to live in a total fantasy world where the sun sets in a pool of water, somewhere way out there. Maybe we can jump in a car and drive there one day. If Alexander got there on a horse, we can get there in a car. And it shouldn't be hard to find, we can just follow the sun. Living in total denial is a heavy price to pay, but it's what you have to do if you want to be a faithful follower of Muhammad. Second, you can reinterpret the Quran. When you reinterpret the Quran, of course, you're insulting Allah and contradicting Muhammad, in which case you're guilty of innovation and blasphemy. If you take this option, you're free to believe in science and reality, but you'll never be a very good Muslim. Third, if you don't want to live in denial and you don't want to commit blasphemy, you have to leave Islam. The Quran says things that are obviously false. Muhammad won't let me reinterpret them. Muhammad can't be a prophet. So those are your options. Denial, blasphemy, or apostasy. Now which way do we go? Pardon me. That way is a very nice way. 
choice is yours, my friends. But if I were you, I'd go with the apostasy. Holiday road.